2 Timothy chapter 4 will be in verses 1 through 5. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Father, thank you so much. Thank you that you have loved us in, in uh, ways that we can never really fully imagine how, de- how deep your love is for us. Thank you that you sent your one and only son and that, Jesus, you died in our place, paying the penalty for our sin. God, as we're here this morning before you, we ask, God, that our hearts would be softened, that we would be ready to hear what you have to say, that you would open our ears and open our eyes to wonderful things from your word, and that we would leave this place having drawn near to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> For those of you that don't know me, I am uh, Zach Johnson. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. I get the privilege of overseeing the youth ministry here, and it is a privilege. I enjoy it very much. Uh, this morning, uh, as we're getting into the word, the thing that comes to mind is uh, tomorrow's Memorial Day. And with Memorial Day coming, uh, that to you, maybe you might be getting together with your friends and your family. You might be having a barbecue. You might be just enjoying the day off. But the one thing that is important that we remember about Memorial Day is what it's here for, why we have it. As Pastor Joe mentioned earlier, it's about those that took the charge of their nation to defend it, to defend our freedoms and our liberties, and to pay the ultimate price to do so. So as we get together, we honor them, we remember them, and they are worthy of honor. And as we think about that, there's also a charge to the Christian. There's also a charge to a believer. We as the church, the called out ones from the world, the ones that have believed and trusted in Jesus and Jesus has transformed, no longer part of this world, but not of it, and now part of the kingdom of God, we have our own charge. We have a charge in representing God's kingdom as the church. As the church, we are to be an invading army deep within enemy territory. And along the way, rescuing those that have been taken captive by the enemy to do his will. That's who we are. And we have a charge the same. There are five here in the text this morning that we're getting into that the believer needs to be aware of and aware that not only is it not a suggestion, it is, as it sounds, a charge, a command, a call. The first being, preach the word. If you look with me again in 2 Timothy 4, verse 1, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables, describing the time that we live in. We have a charge to preach the word. The word preach simply means to proclaim a message or to be a herald of a message. And of course, the word representing the very word of God, the word of truth, God's truth. So we have a charge as his people, as his church, to preach or proclaim the truth of God's word. And as I think about that, truth is not exactly a popular concept anymore, now is it? Telling someone the truth is a lot more painful than it should be and a lot more resisted than it should be. Anymore, it's, that may not be my truth. That, that's your truth, but that's not my truth. Let me live my truth. That's the culture that we live in, completely denying the idea that there is an absolute truth and that 
absolute truth has its source in its maker, in God himself, and that God has a way in which things are designed to be done for our own good and well-being. So it's hard today to tell the truth. I remember back when uh, we were just finishing up the process of our, our adoption, for those of you that don't know, uh, my wife and I, we adopted from Ethiopia. And part of that was actually going to Ethiopia. Um, our daughter, she had very, very broken English at the time. Um, the, the care center was a wonderful care, care center. They did, they did as much as they could to, to help her learn English and all that, but still very broken English, but we were able to communicate here and there. Um, and part of this culture that we were going into is the idea or concept of a person's name. In Ethiopia, a person's name matters very much, what they are named. It often will come from a season of life that the family might be in, or they've, they'll watch the child even after they're born, what kind of characteristics are they developing, and they'll give, it has importance. My daughter's name, given name, is, it actually means peace. It was given during a time after war, and it was a time of peace. So it was very significant to her. She also has a, an orthodox uh, background, what's very legal, very works-oriented, very don't do this, do that sort of background. <clears throat> so all that to being said, she's learning about us at the same time that we're learning about her. And one of the things that she's learning, other than the fact that her name should be mom, that her mom's given name is Brandy. So in this conversation, my daughter approaches my wife in the cutest, cutest accent that you can imagine. Mama, your name no good. Of course, my, my wife is instantly intrigued. Okay. She, she says, oh, really? Why is that? Z uh, Zaya's answer, I'm so sorry, with hand gesture. I'm so sorry. Your name means bira. It was representing alcohol. And she's trying to communicate to her, especially coming from a uh, uh, background of Orthodox religion, that your name means alcohol, and you drink alcohol, you go to hell. You're in danger, mama. That's the heart that she was coming with, which is a very sweet heart, and of course, that's not the truth. And it's something that, that she grew in, of course, but still, nonetheless, can you imagine what it, was, what it would be like for her, a young nine-year-old girl, you barely met these people, these two strangers from a foreign country, come in and say, we're your mom and dad, and you're going to come across the world and live with us forever. Can you imagine that? The courage it must have taken for her when she heard what her name was and the concern that was in her heart to step up and say, Mama, your name no good. <laughs> she was concerned for her, so she wanted her to know the truth. I'm blessed by that. But we live in a world where that's not the case anymore. Where the truth, when you speak the truth because you're concerned about someone, because someone's put themselves in danger, you're actually putting yourself in jeopardy to open your mouth. But it doesn't change the fact that we have a charge. It doesn't change the fact that as part of God's kingdom, part of his people, we have been charged, preach the word. Tell the truth. Open your mouth for the good of the person that needs to hear it. Now, as Paul's continuing this text, he actually kind of gives us a bit of a layout of how this is supposed to work. For example, when? When do I preach the truth? Well, he says again in verse two, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. This isn't talking about sports, like there's an off season, a draft, a regular season, playoffs, anything like that. In season and out of season, in season means when it's favorable and welcome. Out of season, you can imagine what that means. Unwelcome, unfavorable, unpopular. So when are we supposed to tell the truth? When are we supposed to open our mouth and speak the truth? All the time. We don't stop just because it's not convenient. We don't stop just because it's not popular. The truth is far too important to be designated to a season of convenience. People's lives are at stake. People's souls are in the balance. They need to hear the truth whether they want to or not. It's imperative that it doesn't matter when it is, but you open your mouth, unpopular or popular. 1 Peter 3.15 says it this way. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. 
with meekness and in fear. <clears throat> so that's when. What about how? How should we do it? Uh, maybe you guys have seen this. Maybe you haven't. I don't know. I just remember I was very impacted back when I first got saved. Down in the temple area, there was this guy that had this bullhorn. And I don't know how well you respond to someone shouting through a bullhorn at you. You're all going to hell. You're all worthless and, and things like that. I didn't think that the people that were hearing it weren't responding well. So I didn't think his method was very appropriate. Now, hear me out. Jonah had a similar method, right? Jonah, he, he, he goes in to, to Nineveh and he gives a one-line message. 40 days and you're all dead. Everyone gets saved. The whole city gives their life to God. Everyone repents. So you're thinking, it's good enough for Jonah. It's good enough for me. <laughs> Problem is, Jonah's not necessarily about Nineveh. Jonah is about Jonah. Jonah is about Jonah's heart and his own relationship with God and how he was far. He was in rebellion and his heart was hard. And how God loved Nineveh in spite of what Nineveh had done as the enemies of Israel and how God wanted to use Jonah to reach out to them and save them. But Jonah was resistant. His heart was hard. Praise God that our salvation does not depend on the heart of the messenger. Amen? Praise God that God is that good that even if the person who has a wrong heart shares with you uh, something as simple as that and you repent, God will save you. He is that good. He is that gracious. But my heart breaks for the person whose heart is preaching the truth in a way that would not honor God. So it does matter how we do it. And he gives us a bit of a layout here. Again, in verse two, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. The idea of convince is you want to be able to convict. You want to be able to convey correction, the error of their ways. Show them why the Bible's right. Show them why what they're thinking is wrong and how the Bible is different. You want to be able to convince. You want to be able to rebuke. Now, if you enjoy rebuke, that's probably an area in your heart you need to have God check and change. Rebuke is not something we should enjoy. The idea of rebuke is you're warning someone of the danger that they're in because of their error. You're warning for them. You're warning them because you care about them. You want good for them. Exhort. Using the Bible to cheer on, to urge on our fellow believers, to, to do what God has called them to do, to, to make sure that they're right with God, to keep going, to press on, to don't give up, to exhort, to cheer on. With all long suffering, painfully patient. Meaning that you don't just give up because they don't hear you the first time. It may be that God says, okay, shelve it, come back to it. I need to work on their heart. We'll talk to them later but you don't give up. You pray for the lost. You pray for the person who's confused. You pray for the one who is denying what the scripture says. You pray for them and ask God to, maybe through someone else, that they would bring the truth to them as well. But you're painfully patient and you don't give up. And of course, teaching, imparting understanding, helping them to understand what the Bible actually means. Helping to understand the heart of God, what he's actually saying. Because I don't know about you, but when I got saved, I didn't have this all figured out. And I'm, I don't know if I should say this up here. I still don't have it all figured out. I need the word of God. The word of God teaches me what's right. It teaches me the way. And everyone needs the same thing. And all of that, as I alluded to earlier, you can do all of these things and be like Jonah and have a bad heart. You cannot preach truth effectively without love. If you are not preaching the truth, if you're not sharing the word of God without a loving, if you're doing it without a loving heart, you're doing it in a way that's only gonna impact and hurt you. God may be gracious and save them in spite of you, but you yourself are not in the right place. When I got put into leadership at the company that I'm at several years ago, uh, one of the things that still sticks with me, and I still have it, maybe a, a bit of a cheesy thing, but it means it meant a lot to me when it was given, it was from the vice president of the company, and he gave us, uh, anyone that was brought in onto his leadership team, he gave us all a plaque. And the plaque said something along the lines of, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. 
And I'm aware that he's probably not the one that came up with that saying. I'm pretty sure he heard it from someone else. And I'm aware that, that it's been around for a while, but that was the first time that I'd heard it. And it, was in, it wasn't even in the context of being saved. It was in the context of a corporate setting, business. And it was important to him that his leadership team took that to heart, hung it on their desk, and did everything that they did from that plaque. Your team needed to know that you cared about them. His idea was if they know that they care about you, then the coachings that you provide them will only be received better and will make them more efficient and their people, not just employees. How much more so when we're preaching the word? How much more so when we're sharing the truth of the word of God? It's not just another notch on our belt. We're talking about a human life. We're talking about a human being. We're talking about someone who desperately needs God in their life. And without God in their life, they're in grave danger. How much more so should we communicate with love then? How much more so should we care about people then? Ephesians 4.15 says, speaking the truth in love may grow up all things into him who is the head, Christ. <clears throat> so our first charge, preach the word. Our second, the believer is charged to not only preach the word, but to be watchful. Look with me at, at, ver, at verse five. But you be watchful in all things. Now the, the word watchful, the idea is sober-minded or clear-headed that your thinking is safe. If your thinking is safe, you're clear-headed and, and you're able to see things clearly, the decisions that you're going to make are therefore going to be safe. You're not gonna be making funky decisions. You're not gonna be doing things that are gonna put yourself or others around you in danger. Now, the, one of the, my favorite examples of this, and it's more of a silly example of when I wasn't clear-headed or wasn't thinking straight and therefore wasn't able to see clearly, happened about seven years ago at, a, at our summer camp, and it was in the middle of June, of course, when we usually do summer camp, but there was something a little bit different about this summer camp. It was a blizzard in the middle of the week in June. We had a blizzard. We're talk we probably got about maybe that, that much snow. And through all this, it was a blast, right? That we're talking, we have people out there making snowmen, having snowball fights. We had a group go off to the paintball range before it started snowing. They come back looking like they had come from a war zone, just all muddied up and like, yeah, this is awesome. <clears throat> and we go through the rest of the day. We have our, our, pl our normal plans. We do the campfire at, at night. The, the youth have a great time and we dis dismiss them to go back to their cabins. And then we have some of the leaders stayed out. Well, we had some of the leaders going with the youth, but some of the leaders stayed back. We had a campfire still, just stayed up. We shared about what the Lord was doing. We were encouraging one another, laughing, all that fun stuff. And then we decided, you know, we all need to go to bed too. Otherwise we ain't gonna have energy for, to deal with the rest of this week. So leaders start to get up and go. And as I'm looking down, I'm starting to get panicked because we got a, a fire going. I don't know if you know this, it's not safe to leave the fire going when you go to bed. So you gotta do the responsible thing, gotta put the fire out, right? And I'm, I'm panicked because there's normally a hose available to us to put the fire out. And I, I turned to the leaders and I'm like, hey guys, uh, how are we gonna get the fire out? And they're like, well, with water? I'm like, yeah, but the hose is buried. And it was buried, again, like that much. But the hose is buried, guys. How are we gonna get to the hose? I can't even find the hose. And the leaders thinking I'm kidding, they're like, uh, we're going to put it out with water. And I'm like, but the hose is buried. And they're like, yeah, under the snow. And I'm like, I know. And then after going back and forth on this a couple of times, my wife is finally like, Zach, the hose is buried under the snow. Yeah, I said that already. Snow, water, water, fire out. <laughs> Snow, water. She does and then finally my brain, which had been fried from just exhaustion and all that, finally my brain processes and catches up and realizes how dumb I had sounded for the past probably 15 minutes going back and forth about this. And, and I'm like, oh, water. Snow is water. <laughs> I wasn't thinking clearly. 
I was way too tired. I was, had, my brain was just done. Thank God my wife and the others were thinking clearly enough to realize H2O is the same. <laughs> and we were able to put out the fire after much laughing at my expense. My head wasn't clear. I wasn't thinking safely. I wasn't thinking rightly. I couldn't make a good decision if you'd asked me to. We need to be watchful in our thinking. We need to be watchful in where our head's at and making sure that we're thinking rightly and safely because if we're not, the decisions that we make will not be safe. The, the, the places that we go that we allow our families into, we're not going to take them the right way because our thinking misled us. So we need to be watchful for ourselves and make sure that everything that we're thinking is filtered through the word of God. Philippians puts it this way. You can go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter 4. In Philippians 4, picking up in verse 8. It says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. What a wonderful passage. What a wonderful word that God has given to us to be able to filter our thinking through whether it be the television program that we're watching, whether we're streaming something on the internet, whether it be the, new, the news, whether it be the conversation that we're having around the water cooler at work, the emails that we're exchanging back and forth or the places that we're hanging out with and the conversations that we're having with our friends, whether the, the posts that we see on, on social media, the videos that we watch on YouTube, what if we took God at his word and started using that filter with everything that we have in front of us is it true? If it's the news, probably not. Is it true? <laughs> is it noble? Is it just? Is it pure? Is it lovely? Is it of good report? Is there any virtue and is anything praiseworthy? If it's any of those things, absolutely. Absolutely. That's something that we can think about. That's something that we can make decisions from. If it's none of those things, it's simple. Reject it. Reject it. Don't entertain it. Don't let that take up space in your mind, in your thinking. It's not safe. It's not part of being watchful. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6, puts it this way. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Bringing every thought that we have in our thinking, bringing it all into the subjection of God's word. Bring it all under the subjection of what God thinks. Because if we're thinking anything different than what God thinks and what God says, we're wrong. If we disagree with God's word, we're automatically wrong. So the way to be safe and be watchful in our thinking is put it through the word as a filter and let him make up our mind for us on what's right and what's safe and make our decisions from there. <clears throat> so we gotta be watchful for ourselves. But once we're watchful for ourselves, we also need to be watchful for each other. Be looking out for each other. Brandy was clear-headed enough for me on that night to point out the fact that I didn't understand water anymore. She, she may have had a little bit of fun with it, but she was still loving, and she gently showed me, yeah, you, you need to get some sleep. Snow is water. It'll put a fire out. Oh, I forgot. Literally. <laughs> but she came alongside me because she was clear enough in her thinking, and she was able to show me the error in mine. The same is, goes for you and I. We need to be able to trust one another, to love one another, one another enough to come alongside each other when we're clear in our thinking and we have someone in front of us who is not clear in theirs to be able to gently show them the error 
and help them to be able to see clearly, to think safely, so that they and the ones that they're in their circle of influence are also safe. Jesus put it this way, Matthew 7, verses 3 through 5. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Let me first say what this verse is not saying. This verse is not saying, don't judge me, bro. That's not what this verse is saying. It's, saying, it's not saying that we don't have a right to speak into each other's lives. But what it is saying is before you do, make sure that you're right first. Make sure that your thinking is right, that your standing with God is right, that you don't have something yourself that you need to repent of, that you're seeing things clearly. Once you've done that, now you are safe enough to go to your brother and say, hey man, you got some dirt in your eye. Let me help you get that so you can see clearly, so that we can be there for one another, so that we can love each other that way and care for each other that way. It's part of being the body. It's part of being together. It's part of being united in Christ. Now, as it comes to being watchful, it is very easy for us to get distracted. It is very easy for us to just get tired, even like I was. I wasn't thinking clearly to get burned out. What's the problem there? We need to be able to refocus. We need to be able to regroup. Jesus does exactly that for Martha. In Luke chapter 10, you can turn there if you like. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Martha and Mary, two two godly sisters, they love Jesus very much, both of them. Jesus loves them both very much. One of them is, is doing what's needed. The other one is serving. And she's doing a lot of it. And she gets a little frustrated in that. She's tired, she's worried, and all these things are getting to her. And Jesus helps her out in her thinking here. Luke 10, 38 through 42, it says, Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet, and she heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Now, stop there. The moment you're telling Jesus to do something, you're probably not right. If you're telling Jesus what to do, I'm willing to bet you're probably off. So, therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. And Mary chose that good part which will not be taken from her. What's the one thing she chose? She chose to hear the word. She chose to be with Jesus. She chose to be at his feet. Mary could see things clearly because of her proximity to Christ. Martha was confused because she's distracted by all these different needs. And that can happen to any of us. We all have needs. We all, we all have these things that need to get done. We all have this service that needs to happen. And service is good and right. Jesus isn't saying that serving is wrong by any means. But what happened is she allowed all these worries and anxieties to get inside her head and confuse her to, and miss the one thing she really did need to be with Jesus. She had lost her watchfulness. If you're distracted, you need only to get back at Jesus' feet. If your thinking has been off, if, you, if your watchfulness has been, been off, you need only to get back at the feet of Jesus and hear from him and his word and he'll make it right. So our charge is to preach the word, to be watchful, and third is to endure affliction. Look with me again at verse five. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions. Now, afflictions, that's not exactly our favorite topic. We don't like to uh, talk about it all the time. And if we're honest, we would rather not be afflicted most of us, I would say, that it's probably safe if I ask you to raise your hand. And maybe you would, maybe you'd like, no, I want the affliction. It makes me tougher. Okay, that's fine. I personally, I'd rather not have to go through it. And there's a way that you can not go through affliction for your faith. Just don't open your mouth. 
don't make it known to anyone that you love Jesus. Or if you do, just kind of keep it to yourself and let everyone, you know, I'm going to mind my own business, you mind your own business, you, you be you, I'll be me. Just kind of do that and never actually live out your faith and speak the truth. If you do that, you kind of hide, you won't suffer affliction. It's kind of like when I went to the Cowboys versus Bears game a couple years ago. I was really excited about that game. Um, we actually getting to go to the game and see it live. I don't know if any of you have ever done that before, but it's a really unique experience, a lot of fun, and I'm a crazy Cowboys fan, as most of you know. So I was really excited about that. The problem was it wasn't in Dallas. It was in Chicago at Soldier Field. So as I'm getting ready for this game, I'm starting to have this internal conversation. Do I really want to go decked out in all my Cowboys gear? The, the loud, obnoxious part of me is like, absolutely, I'm all in, let's do it. The other part of me where I realize I'm in Chicago and I don't necessarily want to be ridiculed, beat, or shot, I'm thinking it's December, I don't have a winter Cowboys coat, let's, let's, I need to be responsible for my physical health so that when I get back home, I'm not sick. I can get to work and support my family. So I'm going to just wear a responsible, healthy winter jacket, and, and that's that. And we're going to go like that. Holy heart, wholeheartedly in my heart, understanding that part of it was because I'm a coward. <laughs> going, going through the gates, going through that. Okay, great. I'm seeing all these Bears jerseys, all the Mike Ditka lookalikes. And I am just realizing, man, I'm getting deeper and deeper in. And then I realized where we're sitting, that like it's like the bear cave. It might as well be. There's bear fans everywhere. And of course, the people I'm with are avid bear fans. So I'm literally surrounded by the enemy. But I'm thinking, okay, it's cool. The guys haven't, haven't ratted me out. They haven't let anyone know I'm a Cowboys fan. I'm safe. I'm good. Then the game started. And the Cowboys, man, like they do every year, they start so well. They go just right down the field. It looks majestic. Touchdown first play. And I betrayed myself because everything welled up with me. Yeah! Every guy, every girl, every person in the, in the area around me fully knew where I stood in that moment. And at that point, I was confident enough, well, they look really good. We're going to blow you guys out. I'm good. And then that was the only touchdown they got for the next three quarters. <laughs> the Bears completely just destroyed them from that point on. The guys I'm with, they're having a blast just sandwiching me between them. And every guy around, every girl, everyone in the stand around us that had witnessed my uh, enthusiasm decided that I needed some payback. So every time the Cowboys threw an interception, fumbled, every time the Bears got a touchdown, which just only stacked after stacked, it was ridiculous. It was, it should not have been that great, but they did. Every time, everyone around me is like, yeah, take that Cowboys fan, huh? go cry to Jerry Jones. I'm like, <laughs> it's like, oh man, I out of myself and now I'm just, I'm paying the price. I could have resisted that moment early on when I was celebrating that, that touchdown and it would have been fine the rest of the night. And I know the guys that were with me would have respected that and just enjoyed the time. But once I let it out, it was already out. <laughs> And now I was suffering the affliction due. That's just a silly Cowboys football thing. How much more when it comes to our passion and love for Jesus Christ? How much more for the one who took my sin upon himself, walked up to Calvary, and was nailed to a cross in my place? How much more the enthusiasm should rise up in me and not be contained to be able to shout out to the mountains, Jesus loves me, I love him, and he loves you. And not be ashamed to do it. So you can avoid affliction, but it means hiding everything that is true about who you are if you love Jesus, if you've been saved. <clears throat> if you've been saved, if you're a follower of Jesus, affliction isn't something that you can avoid. In fact, you should expect it. First of all, because Jesus was afflicted. How can we hope to avoid affliction when the one we follow was the afflicted one? In John 15, 18 through 20, it says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also 
persecute you. And then it goes further in the next chapter. And not only that, should we expect persecution? Should we expect affliction simply because we follow Jesus because it happened to him first? But when they, when they afflict, when the world afflicts, they will do it thinking they're doing the right thing. Process that for a moment. In John 16, verses 1 through 4, Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. Process that for a moment. Does that not in some ways describe the direction that our own culture is going in? Good is evil, evil is good. If you speak out the truth from God's word, you're evil. If you share the gospel, you're a bigot. <laughs> Even going as far as everything is racist now, including sharing the gospel in some ways. The problem is the enemy has captured this world, deceived it, and they've take, been taken captive to do his world. They've given into a lie. And so they can't see clearly. They can't see the things of the Spirit. They can't see the things that are right. And so there will come a time when we are afflicted by someone who thinks they're actually doing the right thing. <clears throat> and then God puts it just as simply. If you want to be godly, if you want to follow him at all, persecution is guaranteed to happen. 2 Timothy 3.12, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So, you can avoid it by not living out your faith and hiding it. Or if you decide that Jesus is worth living for, you will be afflicted. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's going to happen. Now, affliction comes in many forms. There's the physical persecution that, we, if we're honest with ourselves, we're not really that in danger of that here where we are. We are blessed to live in a country where we're free to meet in this building right now, where we're free to openly talk about God's word, where we're freely openly worship him. That could change sometime in the future, but right now it's not the case. In other parts of the world, there, there are underground churches that are literally risking their lives to be together, to hear the word of God. So that is real. There's other forms of affliction that we might endure. Legal action, fines, lawsuits, possibly jail time, especially as certain things get passed as far as hate speech goes. That could be coming our way. You could lose your job. You could have your career limited because you're outspoken about your faith. You can lose relationships with your parents, your brothers, your sisters, your friends, your family, your, your childhood friends. You could lose relationships, suffer isolation. You could be put to public shame, hate, and you could even be canceled. And that's just a small list of affliction that we could expect. I'm not saying that we should be gluttons for punishment and that we should hope that it comes. But what I am saying is that there's a reason Jesus told us it was coming that we should be ready for it and follow the charge to endure. When, as I mentioned earlier, we adopted our kids from Ethiopia, when we were going through that process, that was a several year long process with a lot of hardship and a lot of bumps on the road, a lot of things that didn't go right. A lot of, by the end, probably between 80 to 100 grand in just a short time, time of span is what we went through. Part of that was legal, <clears throat> part of that was uh, the financial just paying the fees. We were with uh, an agency early on that we had discovered wasn't exactly doing the best up and up practices and really couldn't guarantee certain eth uh, ethics. So we had to back out of that. It was the right thing to do, but we were out 11 grand because of it. We couldn't get that back. Um, we then deal with a corrupt government in Ethiopia with a specific uh, part of the government that was refusing to just sign one line of piece of paper that would allow our kids to come home. And that's just surface level stuff that we went through that, to be frank, I wouldn't wish on anyone else to go through if they were to choose that process. But for me, I wouldn't change a thing for it because of what was the result at the end. My family together, my kids. I would go through it all over again if it meant making sure my kids were in my family. Enduring affliction has everything to do with the outcome that you're hoping for in the end and that you've been guaranteed and promised. Hebrews 10, 35 through 39 says, therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, 
you may receive the promise for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Back then, the believers were also in a very well way, real way dealing with affliction, and they had the choice. Go back to the Jewish religion, animal sacrifices, or continue on in the Christian faith following Jesus. And it really was a matter of life and death to them. To them, what helped them hold on and what God has helped calling them to cling to is the reward at the end. Salvation, Jesus forever, heaven, eternal life, no more pain, no more sorrow, joy forever. Jesus is worth enduring. Jesus is worth enduring whatever affliction, whether you actually suffer physical affliction or if it's something like losing your job because you stood up for your faith. Jesus is worth it. And that's why the charge is to endure it, to keep going. And in the process, you might find yourself to be a witness to someone else on the outside looking in to see that you love Jesus and your faith is for real. And it might be the first time that they see real faith exemplified and the gospel exemplified. It might be the first time they're open to actually hearing the gospel and believing it and getting saved themselves. We have to endure. So the believer is charged to preach the word, to be watchful, to endure affliction and forth, to do the work of an evangelist. Now, everyone in this room, and we'll talk about a little bit more, we're all called to something in the church, but not everyone is called to be an evangelist. Teachers are called to teach, leaders are called to lead, servants are called to serve, pastors are called to pastor, evangelists are called to evangelize, and so on and so forth. But not everyone is called to be an evangelist. In fact, early on in my Christian life, that was something I was like, I was okay with because I don't know about you, but for me early on, I was actually very nervous about talking to strangers about Jesus and the gospel. I didn't have a problem sharing with my friends and family, but when it came to interacting with other people that I wasn't really that close with, it was very different. So this was a passage I clung to, Ephesians 4.11, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Some. I'm pretty sure I'm not in the sum for evangelists is what I was thinking. So I'm good. And if we're honest, a lot of us, we might have this mentality that it's the professional's job to preach the gospel. Because if I preach the gospel, I may say something wrong that gets them off a little bit. And now I've accidentally sent someone to hell. I don't want to be that guy that accidentally sends someone to hell. But the reality is it's not the pastor's job to preach the gospel to your friends and family. It's not the ministry leader's It's not even your parents' job. We've all been charged, we've all been called to do the work of an evangelist. We've all been called to preach the gospel. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In that passage, you might say, well, that was to the apostles. That's not to me. Well, he told the apostles to teach those that would come after him to observe all all the things that he commanded them. And he commanded them, go, make disciples, preach the gospel. It's our calling. It's the main reason we're still here. It's the main reason why when you first gave your life to Jesus, he didn't take you home right away because there's a reason you're still here, and that's one, to go to heaven, but to take as many people with you along the way. There's still people that need to hear about that. Now, have you thought about this? Why is it that God does, doesn't just keep it to the special forces? Because the gospel is such a powerful, important message. Why doesn't he just limit it to the special forces of the Christian church to be the ones to carry that message? Why is it that he wants us all to spread that message, the message of the gospel? Well, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that, one, the fact that he transformed you and saved you, there's going to be something that in you would rise out and want to talk about it. But there's also the idea of strategy. The idea that I can't go everywhere that you can. Pastor Joe, Pastor Dan can't go to all the places that you can. I can't go to all the places my daughter can. 
In my family alone, strategically, if you think about God's mind in this, in my family alone, just between the four of us, the gospel can get inside a ballet studio as my daughter shares the gospel and the love of Jesus with all of her friends in ballet. It can get inside an elementary school. As my, my son, he asks people, hey, are you Christian? Just even starting that conversation, you might think that that's not preaching the gospel. Well, he's starting the conversation. What does it mean? Why, why are you asking? I can't get inside his elementary school like that. I can't be like my wife who has access to five different loads of junior highs and high schools and school buses twice a day who has been given the opportunity many times as they've talked to her and asked her to hear the gospel. I can't get on that school bus. I can't impact all of those schools and all of those neighborhoods the way that Brandy can being strategically placed there by God. And they can't be where I'm at at work, impacting my boss, impacting the people that work for me when I get the opportunity, opening my mouth to share the love of Jesus. And that's just my family of four. How much more so everyone re represented in this room or watching online? Where are you? Where has God strategically placed you that others can't get to and now God has an in to be able to reach out with his love because he passionately loves them and it's his desire that none should perish. And you might be the one that he's using strategically in that place to bring the gospel to them. That's why the charges do the work of an evangelist. Preach the gospel. So we have a charge to preach the word, to be watchful, to endure affliction, and to do the work of an evangelist. And lastly, a charge to fulfill our ministry. As I mentioned, not everyone is called to be an evangelist, but we're all called to preach the gospel. We do all have something to do. We are all called to be something. We are called to do something. Each person, if you're saved, you have a gift and you have a calling and you're the one that is supposed to fulfill it. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7 says, there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all meaning that each person that's saved, that's a member of the body of Christ, you've all been given something to do and it's not for you. You've all been given a gift. You've all been given a ministry and it's not for you. It's for the benefit of the church. It's for the benefit of the other believers. It's for the benefit of the rest of the body. So when we hold back and we decide, you know what? I'm just gonna chill. I'm just gonna sit and relax. I'll come to church on Sunday, Wednesday, but that, that's it. And not really do anything with what God has given to us. It's not just that we're ripping off ourselves and the, the blessing that we get from being a servant and being used by God, but we're actually robbing our brothers and sisters of being benefited by our gift, by our ministry. We're here to minister to God and to one another, to build one another up. Romans 12, 6 says, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. We all have something to do. Back when I was in junior high, about a year ago, <clears throat> Back when I was in junior high, I, I got to be that, that guy that was part of the jazz band, and I loved it. <clears throat> I would never have admitted it back then, <laughs> but I did. And I, to this day, I regret that I put down my saxophone because I love playing that thing, and I would play it again if I could. But being part of that band, there was, of course, times that we would put on concerts for our school. Our, our, our fellow students would come, and, of course, our parents would come. And there was a time that we were going to play the theme from Star Wars. And you better believe that me as a 14, 15-year-old Star Wars nerd was all about that. It's like, yes, this is what I was born to play, man. I was so excited, just got it going in my head, and I'm ready to just get it out. And dur, 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 dur. Just, yeah, it was that out of tune, too. I was that excited. 
I wanted to be the guy that was going to be, you know, the big opening part, the big crescendo that starts and just do all that. I was ready. And then teacher puts my music piece in front of me. And I start to read it and realize, hey, that's not the big part. I, I, but I wanted the big part. You can't, you can't give a junior high Star Wars nerd the, the Star Wars song and not give them the big part. The reality is the part that they gave me was one of the, the underlying tome ones where it was supposed to support the, the grander part. It was supposed to be the part that made the crescendo the crescendo, the underlying support to it. And I had to, in my very mature junior high days, submit to my teacher and realize that they were right. No, I was bummed about it. <laughs> but as I look back on that, I realize how cool that was that I got to be part of the thing that made the whole what it was. That I didn't necessarily have the big piece in front, but I had part of that piece that made the whole thing work together. And that's what the body of Christ is supposed to be. We've each been given a piece to play. You may have the part that that's the crescendo. You may have the part that's the supporting part of it. But if one of them is missing, the whole thing is not complete. Both of them are necessary. You may not be up here giving a message. You may be the one that's cleaning up the parking lot. You may be the one that's cleaning up the restroom. You may be the one up there upstairs with the kids. But not one is greater than the other in the sense that all of them are critical to the ministry. Think about it along these ways. Let's say we have an unbeliever coming in and they decide to go to the restroom and it's disgusting. Let's say our parking lot's been thrashed. They come in, how ready are they to really hear from this guy up here that wants to talk to them about stuff in the Bible? They're distracted when they come in. See, each part of the body is important because it works together as a whole. And as we have someone who's gifted in facilities and takes care of the restroom and the parking lot so that when people come in, it's clean in the restroom, it isn't disgusting. They come in ready without distraction. They know that they're cared for, that it's taken seriously enough, or that your kids are, are being cared for with excellence upstairs, being cared for with teachers that actually love them and are responsible you don't have to worry about what's going on with your kids because you're not distracted by that because the body is working together to accomplish the glory of God. So now that when we're all here and under the word, the distractions are removed and we can just sit and be ministered to by the Holy Spirit. We're all necessary. We are all essential workers. We are all necessary parts of the God and when we're not uh, um, part of the body of Christ and if we're not here, it's missed. It's noticed and there is an impact. <clears throat> which on a side note, which is why I think that the more and more we move forward, the more and more we need to be together. Praise God for technology that we have, the online services that we've been able to, to move forward and minister to people through that, but it's not the same. The body is meant to be together. The church is meant to be together, ministering to one another, building up one another, bringing glory to our God. <clears throat> so we have a charge, just like the American soldier, as we celebrate tomorrow, we, we honor tomorrow, Memorial Day. They, ha they have, were given the charge, defend our freedom, defend our nation, and they paid for it with their very lives. That's worth honoring. That's someone that, that should be honored. And that's something that's more than just a barbecue. We should look at that with, with sobriety and reverence. They fulfilled their charge. The believer has a charge. The church has a charge. And we may not lay down our lives physically in the same way that the soldier has. But we are all called to lay down our lives for one another, for each other. Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. We need to deny ourselves, put the body first, put the will of God first and recognize that the charge that we've been given is not a suggestion. We have a command from our king. And the charge is preach the word, be watchful, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist and fulfill our ministry. Imagine what God can do with a people wholly committed to doing that. Just stand with me.